speaker we're having come in in a couple of months. And I think, J.B., you can just talk about it for one second. Sorry, I'm J.B. Silver, for those I haven't met, a professor of also banking and finance, but I do health care, too. We're having one of my former colleagues from the Harvard Business School in on uh, February 17th. Regina Hertzlinger is the uh, first female professor at the Harvard Business School, full professor, and a former, uh, former colleague and a good friend. And she's done a lot of consumer-driven health care. So for those of you on the employer side, I think this is an important opportunity to talk to probably, not probably, the most important person in the country about what consumer-driven health care, health savings accounts, uh, high deductible plans, things of that sort are all about. But more importantly, how the market will change health care. And I think she's probably right on this one. So anyway, you're w welcome to come. And there's a brochure in here. So please follow up, and I'll see you in February. Thanks, Jimmy. Um, so, again, Peter sort of has set the stage uh, with with what happened. Peter, I've had a lot of requests uh, for people to see all your slides. Can you tell us how you can go about how they can go about seeing them all, or do you have an easy answer for that? I'll give them to you, and you can post them up on the website. Okay, so we'll put them on our website. So if you come to Executive Education's website, uh, we'll get them up there, so you'll be able to see the slides. And of course, you'll be able to review the video on YouTube um, as soon as we can get it up there. So next, for the next portion, I'd like to turn uh, things over to Scott Fine. Scott is a, a professor here at, at the Weatherhead School and also has, many of you know him, he's, he's a long history uh, in industry and uh, in, in banking specifically. And, uh, and he's going to lead the next portion of our discussion. Scott Fine. Thanks, Michael. Um, you know, I focus uh, in the finance department on the industry that used to be called investment banking. Sorry, sorry, Ross. Is that okay if I call it the banking? It used, used to be there, the uh, industry that used to be called investment banking. And also on uh, M&A and, um, uh, and on venture capital and private equity. Uh, I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about the, uh, seems like two years, but it's only been a couple of months that the government has uh, been intervening with this crisis. Um, and then uh, I'm going to let uh, my colleagues introduce themselves. We're going to really talk about this intervention in the crisis from an economist standpoint. Justin? Yeah, um, just to <coughs> introduce ourselves quickly. I'm Justin Sidnor. I'm a faculty member in the economics department. Um, so full disclosure here, I am by no means a macroeconomist whatsoever. Um, I actually specialize in behavioral economics, which is sort of about psychology of individual decision making, which has some relevance to what we're talking about. But mostly what I'm going to do today, or sort of prepared to talk about, is I've been kind of following what the expert economists have been saying. Um, so people like Paul Krugman and that type of person. So what I'm going to try to do is distill in sort of big picture ways the consensus that is formed amongst economists over what's been going on over the last few months. Um, and then we can kind of talk into some details of that. And I'm Nicola Cetera, colleague of Justin's in the economics department. Uh, and again, not a macroeconomist myself, but I'm interested again in fields that are related, uh, if you want, to what is going on in economics of organizations and incentive provision, incentive alignment, and so on and so forth. What I'm going to talk about here is the, if you want, non-consensus uh, among economists and some alternative uh, provisions that have been proposed by some you know, very prominent economists, especially at the University of Chicago, which are sort of more market-driven, if you want, rather than calling for a you know, strong and massive uh, government uh, intervention. Thanks. I'm going to spend a few minutes going through what's happened. We've all sort of been reading it every, uh, every day for the last couple of months. We had the um, Troubled Asset Relief Program that was not passed and ultimately passed. Um, and it really is hard to believe that it was really just a couple of months ago. It seems like it was two years ago. Um, the $700 billion that was authorized was authorized in two stages. The first stage was $350 billion, and then the second two stages are an additional $350 billion. Um, if we take a look at the provisions under TARP, it was a pretty broad-based uh, initiative, and there were a lot of things that were talked about. I think what really got most of the focus was really, uh, relieving the, uh, the, the uh, debt service burdens of actual mortgagees. And obviously, as time went by, the focus of the program was less on um, the, uh, the mortgagees, even less on uh, mortgage-backed security purchase programs, and really became uh, solely focused 
on equity purchase. And you know, I think there's a um, fundamental reason for that. I think as the uh, as TARP was enacted and as we sort of entered this crisis, a lot of people thought there was a liquidity problem, and that really what we needed to do is provide liquidity to most of these financial institutions and taking a lot of this so-called toxic debt off of their hands. But it fairly, with a loss of confidence in the entire banking system, became much more of a solvency problem. Some questions about whether these institutions were going to remain solvent, which is why uh, it really turned into equity. Um, New York Times has been, I, I think, one of the best sources of information, and they just have this knack <coughs> of presenting things graphically. This is a summary uh, from about a month ago. Uh, they estimated the exposure uh, of the various aspects of the government to this bailout to the tune of about $5 trillion. And the, um, the actions taken by either the Fed or Treasury or other aspects of the government really trace back uh, about a year ago uh, when the, the Fed started providing uh, liquidity uh, in terms of uh, uh, you know, providing liquidity on a lot of ass asset-backed securities. We sort of trace it through uh, to more recently. Interestingly, this doesn't include $800 billion in uh, the latest acronym, which is TALF, which I'll talk about at the end. That was approved about a week ago. And uh, so that brings the overall exposure to $6 trillion. That's a lot of money. And this is really exposure. I don't think anybody thinks that the actual losses are going to be anything close to this. But the government is certainly on the hook for a lot. Um, as I said, there was a shift about uh, uh, a day, maybe an hour into TARP into really providing equity funding uh, for a variety of banks. It was a very standard set of terms where the government essentially invested uh, in perpetual preferred stock, which counted as equity capital uh, with a set dividend rate. Uh, and in addition to that, uh, the, um, the um, Treasury said that we're going to protect taxpayers by essentially taking uh, a set number of warrants or set percentage of warrants struck the market. So when the banks recover, not only will we get uh, the, the uh, preferred redeem, but we'll also get some of that equity uh, upside. Interestingly enough, although there were some limitations on executive pay, there really was a fairly open-ended use of proceeds. And there are various studies that have shown that a lot of this money is essentially going towards paying dividends uh, for, for, for banks, et cetera. I think some, some studies have, have estimated 50% of the money that we're putting in these banks is going to actually paying dividends to shareholders. Let me see if I can maneuver this one. So the money's gone out fairly quickly. If we take a look at uh, the first tranche, should I say tranche, Peter, or tranche? First tranche of uh, uh, the money approved by Congress, essentially all but very little of it uh, is uh, already committed. And if we take a look at this table, I'm just going to scroll, scroll through it, it essentially ranks by amount of expected investment who's gotten uh, this money. And you can see it basically is a really, 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 really long list. Uh, and it's actually uh, a, a, an even shorter list of who hasn't gotten that money. Unfortunately, one of those that hasn't gotten that money is a fairly well-known financial institution in the greater Cleveland area. I'll just leave it at that. Okay. Um, so there are a couple of other factors to consider in terms of trying to stem this crisis. Uh, you know, the first thing uh, that happened was the Fed lowered the rate several times. Peter talked about that. All the other industrialized countries uh, followed in similar fashion, not only with the rate cuts, but also in trying to support the, uh, the financial institutions. Interestingly enough, I heard there was an update on this yesterday on, uh, on NPR. If you think about who the first parties to the table were in trying to provide equity, it was the sovereign wealth funds. Okay? But they have a lot of money in equities, which are down. They also got most of the revenue from oil prices, which I'm pretty sure are down. So you know, they really aren't there to provide additional equity capital. So really, these governments are one of the few sources of this equity capital. 
And really, what a lot of people wanted to have happen in terms of restructuring the mortgages themselves, Peter talked about some legal limitations on why a lot of the mortgages weren't restructured. But interestingly enough, really the, the culprits, you know, City, Citibank, Bank of America, J.P. Morgan, and Wells Fargo, you know, really have all initiated programs to try to restructure those um, uh, more directly. And a lot of that, a lot of the reason is the reason you know, Peter talked about as well. Cost of foreclosure is so high, they're better off just restructuring these. Uh, the Friday after Thanksgiving, um, the, uh, the Federal Reserve announced an $800 billion purchase program. Um, this the acronym of this is a little harder to remember than TARP. It's TALF. I'm sure there are all sorts of funny fake acronyms that people are using, but TALF is the Term Asset Backed Securities uh, Loan Facility. And essentially, uh, it has two components. One uh, is $600 billion um, in mortgage-backed securities from Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and Ginnie Mae. Really, it's for new mortgages. Um, and so, uh, essentially, the Fed is providing some liquidity to buy mortgage-backed securities on new loans. Uh, and uh, the second piece is really trying to uh, en enhance the liquidity for consumer lending, auto loans, um, uh, credit card loans, et cetera. And that's a $200 billion program. And the goal is really to inject liquidity back into these asset-backed markets, which haven't been there. In addition to this $800 billion liquidity facility by the Fed, the Treasury has also essentially provided a $20 billion credit backstop. So it's as though you know, the, the, the Treasury is, uh, is, is put in place a $20 billion credit default swap against the, the, uh, the Fed, essentially printing a bunch more money to provide liquidity. So that's really what's happened, as we've all seen. Let me turn it over to Justin and let him um, sort of describe the economist viewpoint on, on, on what's happening. Okay. Um, so I'll try to be fairly brief. Uh, but let me run down sort of the problem, which we've already heard and sort of know, mortgage-backed securities started this whole mess. Um, the solutions that economists were talking about and how this kind of played out through how the bailout plan evolved. And then finally, maybe most importantly, this big question of is it working, is it going to work, um, and what's the outlook on that? So the first kind of the problem, just to basically sum up what we've already heard, um, is really this started with losses in the mortgage markets. So lots of banking institutions, and so I'm using that as a broad term, not just banks that are insured by the FDIC, but all of the things that operate like banks. They lend long, you know, their, uh, so their assets are in things like mortgages, and they have short-term liabilities. People can call in money from them. So all those banking institutions had exposure to mortgage-backed securities. As the mortgage market starts to tank, those companies then start having <coughs> leverage problems. So they're all, they're all very leveraged. And as the underlying value of those assets starts to fall, they run into basically a classic bank run problem. Okay, so this is a problem that's faced all banks since the beginning of time. Um, you have a little uncertainty or some losses, and all of a sudden people start realizing that you may not be able to pay them out right away, and people start to withdraw their money. Okay? Now, sometimes that's just a self-fulfilling thing. Right? So a bank could be completely sound, and everybody rushes in to get their money, and that causes the problem. And sometimes it could be that the bank is actually not that sound, right? So they've lost enough money on some of the loans they've made out that they genuinely have a problem. And that seems to have been, for many of the banks, the situation here, that there were enough loans mounting in, enough losses mounting in the mortgage-backed securities that banks actually had a problem, that their liabilities might have exceeded their assets. Right? And so that's a problem of capitalization. So as that happened, the credit market started to freeze up. And what did that mean? That means people are starting to withdraw the money. So we heard Peter talk about, um, you know, for instance, as Lehman goes under, all of a sudden people start trying to withdraw money from um, all of the, uh, the money market accounts and things, right? So how many people here actually might have contributed a little bit to this? How many people here back in, let's say, late September, October, thought about withdrawing a little bit of extra cash from the bank at the time? We had that conversation in my household, right? Um, so as that happens, right, it's happening much wider than just us in this room. And as that happens, um, we've got a tightening of credit markets. Nobody lends. People start having to sell off assets to meet these liabilities, and we get this fire sale problem. 
Okay, so we start with this bad spiral of basically a mass bankrupt throughout the entire financial institution, much of which isn't protected under the usual sort of government backstops of FDIC insurance and such. Okay? So you know, about half the what we might think of as the banking system now is in this shadow banking, right? Or in things that aren't FDIC insured, that aren't regulated with enough reserve. Um, so we have that problem. And so then the credit markets start to freeze up, and this starts really affecting Main Street. Right? We start worrying that Case can't withdraw enough money to pay professors from their money market accounts, <coughs> that um, lots of small businesses won't be able to tap them into credits, those sort of things. Um, and so as that season up starts coming, everybody realizes this is genuine crisis mode. Um, there's fears that big institutions are collapsing, the government's getting involved, and yet it's still not enough. And so economists started debating what should be done. And the initial Treasury plan suggested, so this was sort of how things were sold, let's say, late September. The initial Treasury plan was to buy these bad mortgage-backed securities off of the bank's books. Okay? So take the mortgage-backed securities, give the banks what they were worth in the market, and then the banks would have this cash. The alternative that economists, that most economists, the general consensus was that instead the government should be injecting equity. So they shouldn't be trying to buy these mortgage-backed securities. Instead, they should be injecting new equity and getting shares in return. And so the basic difference came down to the problem with um, buying off the mortgage-backed securities. So the problem here was if the fundamental problem was that the value of those assets, the mortgage-backed securities, had fallen so much that the banks were no longer solvent, then the government really only had two choices. So if they bought those securities for what they were worth in the market, well, you gave the banks some cash to play with, but they were still insolvent. So the value of those liabilities had fallen. If you buy them for what they're worth at that low price, the banks are still insolvent. The alternative was to overpay for them. So the alternative was to overpay, and that's what got economists really worked up, is that either you were not going to be effective by buying these assets for what they were worth, or you were going to overpay. And the overpaying would have recapitalized the banks. They would have been solvent again. But who would have benefited from that recapitalization was the existing equity holders in the banks. Okay? The stockholders of the banks would have benefited from that. It would basically have been a giveaway on the part of taxpayers to the banks. So instead, economists were arguing that we should leave the exi existing equity holders sort of wiped out by the reduction of these liabilities, and instead inject new equity into the banks. So essentially, the government holds some value in the upside going forward. So it's not just a straight giveaway. So that was the general sort of conceptual debate. And it played out, initially, the Treasury was arguing for this buy the bad assets approach. And most economists were very unhappy about that and arguing that they should be injecting equity. Over time, it turns out that we actually went the route that the economists wanted the government to take. And that largely was precipitated by the actions of Gordon Brown in the UK and the rest of Europe. So they sort of saw this dynamic on that side, went that direction, and the Treasury here followed suit. And so quickly, this idea of buying the bad assets was essentially abandoned, and instead they started to inject it. And so that's what's been going on since sort of middle of October into November. Okay, so now we need, is it working? So in one sense, it's definitely working. So there was a true crisis mode in the beginning of October, so October 10th-ish. Um, and this was reflected in things like the TED spread, um, so spreads between treasuries and other sort of risky assets and things that really showed um, the credit markets were incredibly tight. Um, and there was generally a sense of sort of panic more broadly, if we think about kind of mass psychology of the thing. That has definitely subsided. And some of the measurables, so the TED spread, had come down from historically incredible levels in early October to really bad levels now in November. But they seem to be holding somewhat steady. Okay? So we seem to have averted the really worst of the crisis, but things don't look good, and they're not improving more. So throughout November, after most of this has kind of gone through, there doesn't seem to be much improvement. So we seem to be holding at a bad, but maybe not quite crisis level. Um, seems to be the consensus that we improve things. Um, so kind of the, the, is this going to continue working? Um, one thing we could talk a bit more about, but I won't talk much about now, is whether is the exact structure of this equity that the government is buying. So economists have debates over whether the government is essentially getting enough control. So a lot of economists think the government should be getting what's called common stock, so voting shares, so that they can really 
influence the behavior of the markets more. There's a subset of economists, however, who very much like the idea of the government not nationalizing the banks, essentially. Um, there's a growing consensus, though, amongst economists that what's been done so far was necessary and averted the existing crisis, but that it's not going to be enough. And a lot of people are betting, so these are people, Paul Krugman, um, Brad DeLong, these are kind of big name macroeconomists, international economists sort of folks, um, are betting that things are going to get worse. And in particular, when you see the eventual write downs of credit card debt and more sort of um, corporate debt, that the banks are going to need to come back. And before it's all done, we'll see almost a full nationalization of the banking system temporarily, is there hope on that. Um, but a lot of people are sort of hinting in that direction that you know there's still mortgage losses to come. Um, best projections suggest that subprime stuff has probably hit its peak, but prime loans still haven't hit their peak in terms of um, defaults. And we haven't really started to see the wave of credit card defaults yet. Um, and a lot of the sort of uh, corporate default that we'll probably see. So best guess is that it's not over and we'll see more of this stuff. And I'll hand it over to Nico now, who's going to talk just real briefly about um, sort of the other consensus. So my main consensus is that economists were pushing for big government intervention, purchase of equity, gigantic movements into uh, these banks. And Nico's going to talk a little bit about a smaller subcurrent of economists who've been arguing that instead of these big government injections, there are ways in which the government could simply help facilitate more private market transactions. Yeah, I mean, there is a, a consensus among all economists, and you know, not only economists, I mean, everybody in this room, that you know, we are in an exceptional, uh, in exceptional situations. Uh, we are in a sort of a crisis. But not everybody believes that we need to respond to this exceptional situation with you know, exceptional, if you want, policies, right? So, you know, historically, if you want the normal time, you know, what the government does is, uh, you know, fiscal policy, monetary policy, so acting on the interest rate, you know, the, uh, the Federal Reserve, and so on and so forth. But this doesn't seem to be enough. So, you know, many are arguing that, you know, this big, you know, government intervention and, you know, bailing out and so on <coughs> should be going on. A subset of very influential economists are saying, though, well, let's, let's wait a second, let's, let's think about a couple of issues here. So, first of all, what is the cost of taxpayers? So this is another thing that you know interests not just economists but you know, everybody who pays taxes, right? So are we really creating value here? In other words, so what we are doing on the positive side is it justified? I mean, what we are paying for this is it justified by the positive side, or is just sort of a zero sum game in which we are not creating any uh, any additional value? There is an, an additional issue that economists are very interested about and are very worried about, worried about is this concept of what we call selective intervention, right? So let's start, you know, we start with the banking sector, what's next? The automotive sector, uh, right? The question is, what's next? And what is the problem in acting like this and not acting, you know, in general ways and, you know, by principles, if you want? You create a lot of uncertainty, right? So what's next? What's going to happen? You create a credibility problem, right? Because you give the impression as a government that you are acting uh, you know, not according to a plan, but just as, you know, events sort of unfold, you do something, you know, because it's always an emergency and it doesn't give much credibility and, and uncertainty. And in addition to that, it makes lobbying much more profitable now. So different industries, different sectors can just, you know, uh, jump on their private jets, go to Washington and that's the money, essentially. Where does this stop, right? So. These economists, uh, and you know, just to mention some names, uh, Luigi Zingales, John Cochrane, uh, Raghuram Rajan, who was at the uh, International Monetary Fund up to a few years ago, and so on and so forth, are saying, well, let's go back to what actually we know is working pretty well. Are there market mechanisms there, which doesn't mean like the pure free market, but also some institutions, Chapter 11, uh, the FDIC, and so on and so forth, which are working pretty well, and can we sort of apply uh, some versions, if you want, some modifications of these institutions for what's going on now. And they've been advancing a few proposals. Let me give you some examples very quickly. So let's consider the housing market first, which is where apparently this all started to some, to some extent. So some are advocating, for example, supporting house prices, which doesn't, it's not exactly clear what it means. Does it mean you know, destroying houses so we have less supply and higher prices? It's not very clear. There are other ways to sort of solve the problem that many have with their houses and bring their mortgages. 
So just to give a quick example, so suppose you bought a house for you know, four hundred dollars, four hundred thousand dollars. All of a sudden, and you pay a mortgage based on that uh, on that value, right? All of a sudden, your house is worth on the market two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, for example, right? So even assuming that you have the money to pay your mortgage month by month, you might decide not to do so because if you do so, you are left with an asset which is much less valuable than the one you you thought originally, right? So you might well decide that if you know, the optimal thing for you is just to default, right? Which means, you know, you don't own your house anymore, you don't have any incentive to keep, you know, to take care of your house, and so on and so forth. This is, of course, not good for you because you're going to lose your house anyway. It's not good for the value of the house, which is going to go even more down because you don't take care of it. In the old time, when, you know, the mortgage was, you know, held by your bank, the bank, for example, or any other institution might just forgive part of your debt, and you know you can renegotiate in this way, which was sort of optimal for everybody. But now, with you know, uh, you know, your mortgage being held uh, through you know, securitization and so on by many holders, it's very hard to sort of undertake this sort of simple renegotiation. So one idea that was proposed is the following: so your house goes down for four from. Uh, 400,000 to, to uh, 250, well, you essentially renegotiate and you're paying now a mortgage based on a $250,000 value, right? In exchange, you give to the bank essentially the right to, for example, 50% of any reevaluation of the house for now, from now on. So if you sell the house and if it's, uh, it's worth more than, you, know, it's, you, you get them more than $250,000, then half of the, uh, if from profit uh, or surplus, you give it back to uh, your uh, your lender, essentially. The idea here is that as a borrower and as a house uh, owner, you keep uh, you know uh, the house with you, and so you have incentive to keep it in good, uh, in good shape. And also, this gives some rate to uh, to your lender, uh, essentially. So this is a plan that uh, has been uh, has been proposed. And you know, the idea is that renegotiating is very uh, difficult in this environment. So there is a market failure there. As a government, we facilitate this process by actually forcing the lenders to propose this, uh, uh, this deal. The, the borrower, uh, the homeowner, can decide whether or not to, uh, to do that. And as it turns out, this is nothing really fancy or unusual. Stanford University, to mention just uh, one example, does that with their professors, right? So uh, Stanford helped uh, you know, their uh, faculty to, to buy their houses by putting some uh, you know, uh, down payment and so on. But if the house gains value, then some of this uh, gain goes back to Stanford, right? So if this is something that you know is already there, and it's just a matter of making more, uh, more general. How about the banks? Uh, what is the problem with just bank, banks going uh, bankrupt, right? On one hand, people think of bankruptcy as just the death of banks and companies and so on. This is not really true necessarily. You know, through Chapter 11, you can have a fresh start. Essentially, the problem is that Chapter 11 procedures are very long, and in these times we cannot wait too much to, you know, rescue banks and so on. So what these economists are proposing is a very quick, like overnight plan, which works uh, as follows: so shareholders are wiped out, and uh, debt holders, which are uh, you know senior uh, uh, claimants, uh, you know their debt is is uh, uh, their credit actually is converted into shares, right? So all of a sudden you create more equity for the bank, and you don't have it problem that Justin was mentioning. Sharehold, you know, original shareholders might not be very happy to be wiped out. Well, they are given, according to this plan, an opportunity to uh, buy back uh, the shares from the debt holder now uh, become uh, shareholders at the face value of debt, right? So if they believe in, in, in you know, in the, uh, the health of the bank, if you want, you know, they can buy uh, the shares back, and debt holders in turn will have their money. Uh, their money back as to a normal uh, bankruptcy, uh, bankruptcy procedure. This makes things fast, doesn't liquidate the banks, so the banks are still solvent and, and recapitalized and so on. So the whole idea here is to uh, you know, limit as much as possible strong intervention by the government because it creates uncertainty and it may be very costly, and just try to see whether we have there already some market institutions and market forces that can actually help uh, you know, solving at least part of the problem with no cost or very limited cost to uh, taxpayer. So we gave you the accelerated version. Um, any questions on uh, the bailout or uh, other alternatives? Well, well, question. In the early 1980s, uh, 
Chrysler had a pretty good organized bankruptcy with two banks or whatever, and it came out pretty well. But could you do something like that today with the automakers, or is it an entirely different picture? People are proposing something related to that, some sort of sort of guided bankruptcy, uh, if you want, in which the government, uh, you know, lends money. Uh, but you know, unlike what uh, automakers are uh, proposing, this uh, uh, this uh, this loan is senior to other debts, so it needs to be repaid first. Provided that some provisions are included in this procedure, for example, uh, uh, automakers need to uh, downsize. Okay, there is this big, you know, excess capacity issue, and therefore uh, there needs to be something done there. Uh, other uh, sort of conditions that are called for is like the downsizing of the uh, pension and health uh, benefit uh, liabilities by these uh, by these companies, uh, essentially. So yes, people are thinking of something like the Chrysler case, uh, sort of a, a prepackaged, uh, conditional sort of loan by the government, provided that you go to bankruptcy and sort of uh, you know, restructure the company, quite, quite rightly, actually. Let me add to that just real quickly. I think, to some extent, though, there's kind of two, two problems that make, you know, for instance, the auto industry problems more difficult to use the traditional trails now than usual. Uh, the first is just the general lack of liquidity for the normal players who would be in this bankruptcy proceeding. So the you know the normal folks that would step up, the big banks, the investment bankers, the um, sovereign wealth funds, and the private equity folks are hoarding their cash and they're fairly tight. So it's not obvious that there's enough of that out there to get through the bankruptcy. And the other problem is that you know Chrysler, Ford, and GM were in troubles before the forecasts of the looming recession a big capital R. And so the problem is that it's not obvious just how insolvent and how much how big their problems might be. And they may be so big as to almost force a massive unwinding that's difficult to handle in a sort of classical bankruptcy proceeding without a lot of pain. And that's why um, I think the government's thinking about stepping in is to try to avoid some of that unwinding pain. Well, and the, and the government has, I think, has stepped in. I don't know if they got approved this morning. But does anybody know? The, the, uh, the plan to get approved this morning? Don't know. So I, I don't know how it feels to you guys. It feels to me like this is a toe in the water. It's hard to say that $17 billion is a toe in the water, but it's a toe in the water to see whether or not in you know, three to four months the, uh, you know, the automotive companies can figure out how the heck to get out of this mess. Because that's, that is just a toe in the water in terms of what the scope of the problems are. Any other questions? <laughs> yes, sir. Um, why did the, in, this is a t t to you, Professor Pine, why did the government, um, as far as the first tier banks are concerned, um, a national city was in the second tier, and the government picked and choose. But in the first tier, they insisted that they loaned to everybody, and the argument was that uh, all the banks, including those that were stronger, like J.P. Morgan Chase, uh, the argument was that if they singled out banks for loans that, that uh, the big banks like Citibank, that this would be a, uh, a sort of a taint on that bank, and that they, the public perception or the commercial perception would be not to deal with it. As a result, uh, they were dealing with, uh, uh, with the banks that really didn't need the money. Right. Uh, it was very difficult to negotiate with them in terms of getting them to uh, reduce their bonuses or uh, stop paying dividends or reduce their dividends and so on. Why did they take that tack? Why did the government take that tack? Yes. You know, I, I, I think the reason they took that tack is because, uh, I mean, there have you know, there, been a couple of uh, things that have come out. I don't know if you saw the uh, 60 Minutes interview with Ken, Ken Lewis from Bank of America, you know, who's basically <coughs> asked the same question at that time, things have changed at that time. B of A was in really, really good shape. J.P. Morgan, you know, is probably the only bank among all of them that's still in good shape. And, and when he was asked the question, he said, and I think it's probably the right answer, you know, we basically were, were um, asked, you know, told by Paulson and by the, and, and, and by folks from the government that it was a matter of um, sort of national security uh, to take this money, even if you don't need it, so that everybody's on equal footing. And I think that first round, you know, essentially by size, everybody got the same amount of money by size, 
And it, 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 there's, a, there's, there's an attempt to infuse some confidence back into the system and not single anybody out as being more problematic than another. So I, I don't think it was a choice. I do think... But it's turned out that you know, Citibank is a sick cat. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so the Citibank's had, had much broader... As is Bank of America now, having swallowed both Merrill Lynch and both... Um, 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 in, in countrywide. Yeah, countrywide. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so it's not, it's not, an, easy, it's not an easy answer. I, obviously, that first round of financing wasn't enough. And again, you know, none of these institutions are still, are still fairly challenged. trying to micromanage that a lot, and in part because it's hard, you know, there's been strange movements uh, over the last decade or so in white collar jobs, and it's hard to know exactly, if you try to predict, you know, which is the next business that's going to be offshore, or where's the next place that things are going to go, almost no one can get ahead of that game, and so you can't really design policy around um, precisely where you're going to try to put people to work in those sort of jobs. <coughs> And the devil's advocate view. The, the extreme of this view goes back to you know uh, the Great Depression and so on, when you know some major economists came and some were saying that you know, maybe it's just an, uh, you know uh, you know in these bad times just have people dig holes uh, and then and uh, fill them back, you know, give them some work, give them some money to spend, and it sort of create this you know virtuous circle of this multiplier effect that this called. On the opposite side, some people are. <clears throat> Sorry, a little bit concerned that in order to do all this, you have to raise taxes. Consumers anticipate that they will pay more taxes in the future, so there isn't this big sort of jump in consumption and investments and so on, because you know you have to save for uh, when you know the government will come back and ask uh, and ask for repayment uh, essentially. So there is also this debate on how much essentially this stimulus can actually generate this big, uh, big to circle uh, the adjustment that you mentioned. Okay, we'll take one more question. I'm interested in your um, position on, on public policy in regards to uh, Community Reinvestment Act, as well as uh, the, the Congress's choice not to regulate uh, the spot market in 2003. The Community Re Reinvestment Act was expanded again, I think, in 2003. The charts that were provided earlier, basically, the financial markets really bloomed after that. And so the question is, is how do we move forward with the Community Reinvestment Act, you know, basically lending money to people can't afford to pay it back because that's supposed to be the thing to do. 
Um, and we ended up with the unintended consequence of expanding that, those structured products into the mass market, not just a small market in, say, urban settings that, where they wanted to spur growth. And obviously, the East 50 unregulated um, swap market and think we make it soft regulated. Where do you think that goes from here? Yeah, I, I don't have a point of view on that. It sounds like you may. Uh, so I really don't. So I can give you a little my own impression. So, so I think there will be a lot more regulation in the future of, um, you know, things like the credit default swap market. And I think in general, if you look back, you know, last time, so all the all the parables are being drawn with the Great Depression right now. Um, in the aftermath of the Great Depression, the banking institutions, as they were known were all subject to new regulation. So they were afforded new backstops in the form of the FDIC and landing by the Federal Reserve, and they had new oversights that limited activities they could undertake and increased their reserve requirements. Uh, over time, especially over the last two decades or so, there's been this gigantic boom in unregulated financial institutions, uh, engaging in a range of things that were incredibly highly leveraged. And I think one of the big regulation pushes that will come out of here, you know, I think the folks in finance will talk some about this and also about, you know, executive compensation issues. Uh, I think one of the big pushes will be trying to regulate these types of markets. Um, you know, anything that smells like a bank should be regulated like a bank. Anything that smells like insurance should probably be regulated like insurance is regulated. Um, at least in the extent of reserve requirements and those sort of things. Um, as in particular because I think we've shown now that there is an implicit government backstop to all of this. And if that's going to exist, then I think we have to have some sort of regulation of those things. Um, in terms of the Community Reinvestment Act, I think the, you know, my sense is that the, the jury's kind of out on that one. Um, so it's certainly true that people are worried that that kind of push had, you know, led to some of the rise in the subprime. Um, but a lot of that push was through, so, Arguments being made are that, one, that in broad strokes, that existed since the 70s. Um, and it wasn't until later. So there was this expansion in 2003. The other issue is that if you look at sort of the role of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and all of this, um, they may have more touched off some of these lending problems in the subprime crisis than really contributing to the bulk of it in the last couple of years. So they lost market share in the subprime post-2004 stuff as the as that really, really hit. So it's not clear that that's, you know, it seems like it's a part, but it's not clear that that's the fundamental thing underlying all of this. Uh, it seems more likely that it had to do with people's, you know, the gigantic securitization, the general acceptance of more risk over time. Um, you know, some people have been arguing that a lot of this has to do with psychology and sort of a reduction in fear over the 90s and late 80s, um, especially the 90s, reduction of fear about markets that had been sort of very healthy since the Great Depression that led us to be a little more cautious with sort of risks over time, and that the size of the bubbles we've seen more recently had to do with some of that sort of easing of general fear of risk over time. Uh, those are hard things to assess, but my guess is that arguments like that are probably going to be slightly more fundamental than some of those policy issues um, that have more of a cumulative effect. Okay, well thank you. Um, thank you for your good questions. I think we'll, uh, we'll take another two minute break, which will turn into a five minute break. Uh, and then we'll have our last panel discussion and address any other questions you have. Thanks.